right, hello everybody and welcome to this week's webinar. I'm Annalie Kate, uh, joining you here, uh, CEO of Route Consultant. Uh, happy to have you guys all in attendance this week. Uh, excited to dive into some content, talk about some other things happening in the space right now. Lots of big events going on, uh, lots of big conversations happening. So uh, we're gonna dive into all of that here today. Uh, if you're first time on our webinar, uh, before I get started, let me just read a quick disclaimer and then I'll give you the rundown of what to expect from today. Um, so real fast, Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation and FedEx Ground or Amazon. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Uh, all that means is not that you will receive any materially non-public information here today, but we do hope that you will receive materially helpful information today uh, on our weekly webinar. Um, this week, we are going to have some fun and have one of my favorite guests to have uh, on the, the webinar with us. Um, real quick housekeeping again for those of you here for the first time. Uh, if you know anything about a route consultant webinar, you will know that these are typically designed to be very fun and engaging. So uh, this will not be your average uh, tuned in boring webinar. Um, so we definitely want to engage with you. If you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A feature. And so we're going to be going to live Q&A towards the second half uh, of today's webinar. So if you have a question, I'm sorry, if you have, yeah, if you have a question that you want to ask on that live webinar section, um, you'll be able to just drop that into the Q&A feature. And then we'll go through those questions. We'll answer as many as we can in the time that we have today. Um, but the rule of a route consultant webinar is that in order to ask us a question, first you have to answer our question. And so we have a question of the day. Uh, today's question is going to be for all the animated characters, whether it's Disney princesses or Pixar or any cartoons, um, if you could be any animated character, uh, which one would you choose to be? And uh, feel free to elaborate on why. Um, so I will answer that question in a little bit. Our guest is going to answer that question for you today. Uh, and then we'll hear uh, just some fun stories about who you would choose if you had to choose. Um, so we'll do that in just a little bit. We'll talk about market updates on inventory, uh, upcoming events that we have, some big stuff happening this month. Uh, but before I do that, I want to bring on our guest today. As I said, I'm a little biased since we've been best friends since we were 12, but I'm going to bring on uh, Grace Bay, the CEO of Patent Logistics. Grace is responsible for all of our trucking operations. Most of you guys probably already know her. She's a wealth of knowledge in the space, um, dispatches hundreds of drivers and trucks across the country for FedEx Ground. So uh, she is going to talk to us a little bit today on peak season, peak preparations, um, but again, also just a resource to answer any questions that you have uh, as you guys are coming into the space. So hello, Grace. How are you today? Hello. Happy to be here. Good. All right. So um, as we kind of get, you know, just jump in, one of the things that you're, some of you may be thinking, okay, peak season, I'm new to this industry, especially if you're, you know, potentially on the looking at entering the space for the first time. Uh, it's August. When we say peak season, we're talking essentially about late November, December, uh, our ramp up for the holiday season when e-commerce goes through the roof. And so uh, we're going to start talking about that now in August, because that's when we, uh, as operators, start having those thoughts and those conversations. So, uh, Grace, tell us just a little bit about kind of where you're at in that, that annual planning process uh, and starting to gear up for peak season. Yeah, so a lot of our timing with gearing up for peak season and starting to think about that revolves around when FedEx starts asking us to have conversations about resource counts, right? Um, so FedEx is actually already having those conversations with us. They're asking us, you know, what are we planning to bring to the table in terms of number of trucks, number of drivers? They started really, really early this year. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that we're starting to bring drivers in yet or bring trucks on yet, but we're starting to think about it so that we can have those conversations with FedEx. Um, so from, from this, you know, calendar date that we're at today, August 3rd, um, we're not bringing in drivers yet. We're not bringing on trucks yet. We're just kind of thinking about planning, thinking about what we want to implement, um, probably closer to October, September, maybe for some vehicle stuff. Um, but yeah, that's where we are. That's perfect. And so I kind of carrying a little further into that. So we're in August. So when September rolls around, Grace, uh, what are some of the things that need to be, you know, potentially considered or set or done by the time September rolls around in preparation for peak? Yep. So um, we recently heard from uh, a lot of the vendors that provide rental trucks for us that we need to secure rentals by September 1st of this year in order to be guaranteed availability. 
Um, and that's really painful, right? Because we're not going to need to actually put these trucks on the road until November. Um, so no, nobody wants to pay for rental trucks that they're not needing. So um, I would definitely encourage people to start talking to your vendors and, you know, trying to get a realistic date nailed down, see if you can work your relationship with your vendors to push that date as far out as possible and not have to commit to the September 1 deadline. Um, we don't even have accurate projections yet, right? So um, for the for the volume that we want to expect, so we can't really nail down our counts yet. We're still planning that. So I would encourage you to have those conversations definitely before September 1st and potentially start looking at other options um, for other rental vehicles outside of your typical budgets, U-Hauls, um, Enterprise, that kind of thing. Uh, Hello Truck Lease is actually going to have some really exciting announcements at the expo in a few weeks around uh, peak rentals in a way that we might be able to help you guys out with that. So um, definitely start thinking about vehicles, though. Yeah, that's a that's a, going to be a big deal. I'm excited for that uh, announcement, too. And, and, you know, as you're thinking about that, Grace, so come check out the expo. Uh, Danielle, I think, can she drop a link? She's going to drop a link for you guys over in the chat feature um, to the expo. So we have our massive annual expo happening uh, in just less than three weeks now um, in Las Vegas. Uh, we're literally taking over the entire Paris Hotel and Casino. Um, actually, in fact, it is sold out at this point, but we're booking rooms in adjacent in Harris where you can literally walk right over to the event. So um, we're expecting more than half of all FedEx contractors. There's literally going to be 3,000 plus people uh, in attendance at the event this year. So it's going to be uh, just a massive showing. Um, and so super excited. Come check us out at that. As Grace said, Hello Truck Lease got some exciting announcements, lots of big announcements that I've heard from vendors uh, and, and, you know, important things that are happening in the space uh, that are going to be announced uh, in Vegas. So we hopefully uh, we'll see you guys there. Um, so Grace, obviously the Hello Truck Lease has a, a great potential there in terms of being a solution for contractors that are trying to figure out how to plan for peak season this year and deal with rentals. Any other tips and tricks in terms of how you, you know, leverage your uh, rental companies or, you know, how, how do you, how do you have a compelling case to try to get pushed back on those deadlines? Cause every week, every dollar is so, you know, so, so important, but is any tips or tricks you have? Yeah, it definitely doesn't hurt to drop off some like donuts or homemade cookies to your local budget. I actually <laughs> uh, have taken homemade cookies to the local budget in St. Louis where uh, where we established our best relationship and we get all of our rentals out of that location. So that one worked pretty well for me. Um, <laughs> but I would also, you know, remind them of uh, the fact that you have options with other vendors out there. You know, there are, there are more and more people coming into the space offering the solution. So, you know, if you commit to a specific vendor for this peak season and, you know, you want to stick with them for following peak seasons, definitely that commitment is important to them. Um, and, you know, I, I think that just working the relationship, trying to, trying to develop that, find a rep that you, you know, really can, um, can leverage that with, don't necessarily stop at just the first person who answers the phone or the first person at the front desk, like find a rep who you can really, um, have a relationship with. Yeah, that's great. So that relationship building is such an important part, uh, to navigating the space. Um, so that kind of gets us through top priorities for September, Grace. You know, as we start now turning towards October and thinking through what what are the big milestones for you when you're peak planning uh, headed into October? Yeah, so October is when we start thinking about staffing. We definitely want to have a good idea by the beginning of October of the number of people we want to bring on for peak season. Um, so the number of seasonal hires you want to add to your team. And when we when we hire for peak, we don't want to hire all of them in the first week of October. We want to try to space it out over six or eight weeks so that we can make sure that we're not just like killing our payroll budget on the very front end of this and then carrying dead weight payroll up until, you know, Black Friday. So I usually make hires in kind of batches of like two or three, and I'll try to make some hires each week as we get closer. Um, you want to finish your hiring process you know, early November, mid-November, so that you have time to train people um, and they can be effective on the routes, but, um, but definitely space it out. I also try to coordinate with my core drivers um, to have them take some time off during that time period that I've got that excess payroll. Um, make sure that you're giving them a break before peak season, before they start working six days a week, seven days a week sometimes. Um, and that's a good way to kind of save on some payroll while you're bringing new people in. 
Absolutely. Super important part of the ramp. And then kind of go ahead and I guess just bring us home into November. Any big things that you're thinking about uh, when November rolls around and you're starting to get ready or, or things that contractors or prospective contractors need to really consider uh, if they're looking at taking over then? Yeah, I think that's when we'll have the best idea of volume projection. So do another check in to say, here's where I am with staffing. Here's where I am with trucks. Do I feel like I am understaffed? Do I feel like I'm overstaffed? do another check in there and just make sure you don't have like a final hiring push you need to make. Um, and also like be honest with yourself about the drivers that you have and if they can handle what you need for them to do, right? And so if you need to make some replacements in that last few weeks, um, definitely start thinking about that, talking to your recruiter about that. Um, but from there, I would say it's just go time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Grace, um, I'm just trying to think through kind of while we have you, you've been through so many peak seasons and you've lived, you know, so many different things. Could you maybe take a minute and just think about some of the challenges that you've had in past peak seasons, or maybe like some of the, I hate to bring it up, but the hardest lessons you've learned that, you know, hopefully what we always try to do, right, is, you know, save the, the new contractors coming in, you know, some of those pains, any kind of war stories or uh, lessons learned the hard way that you would want to spare them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I think this is my ninth peak that I'm going into. We only have a few minutes, so just <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> hmm, can this be a 24 hour webinar? Yeah. Um, okay, so I would definitely say I have made the mistake of keeping a subpar team, like core team of drivers, in place leading up to peak rather than making those replacements. And then I've, you know, supplemented with additional peak hires, but I've had problem children in my core driver group. And so that's something you can be thinking about right now too, is who are my weakest links that I really can't trust to be the backbone of my driver team through peak season and make those replacements now while you have time before you have to start recruiting for peak. Um, and you want your core team of drivers to be as strong as they can possibly be. And if you can't rely on that core, you're gonna have a problematic peak. Um, so that's definitely number one for me. Um, I would say number two would be truck maintenance on your, on your company owned vehicles. So make sure that you, just like you're assessing your driver pool and seeing where your weak points are, do that for your fleet too. Go ahead and assess that now and say, what are some major repairs that I might need to make before peak season so I'm not having unnecessary breakdowns? Um, maybe if you need to do a refresh of your fleet or add some units in, that's a peak season is a really great opportunity to add units to your company owned fleet and utilize some trucks that you might be about to age out of through peak get your new ones before peak so you've got excess vehicles and then after peak you can dispose of the ones that need to be refreshed so um, with that strategy you just start a little bit early for your 2023 peak planning um, so that's kind of an assessment of people assessment of trucks if those two are strong you're going to be good in peak season um, I would say maybe the third thing that can be a pain point is any compliance issues that might be outstanding in your company from, um, well, let me give you a specific. I think this will be more helpful. If, um, if you're having any issues with onboarding your drivers right now or any issues with your recruiting process right now, it's going to be exacerbated through peak. So I've made the mistake of having a really disorganized onboarding system early in our days of FedEx contracting. And when you amplify your recruiting efforts and you start recruiting a high volume of drivers, if that onboarding process is not buttoned up and really smooth, um, then you're gonna have a lot of trouble getting compliant drivers on the road and keeping them. Yeah. Oh. That's such a good one. What about, will you talk a little grace too, um, on just like from a BC perspective, you know, I like literally you did write the book on, you know, hiring, managing <laughs> BCs, the virtual book at least. <laughs> um, but can you talk about like what makes a peak, what makes a BC good during peak season? What are the kind of critical catches or, you know, responsibilities that your BCs are really prioritizing to make peak season successful? Yeah. Um, so from a high level perspective, your BC needs to be really good at not getting stuck in a hamster wheel, right? So your BC needs to be able to elevate out of whatever stressful situation they're in and say, here's a solution that will help the overall problem, not just solve what's right in front of me, right? And so a great example of this is if your BC is trying to contingency plan for a route that might be sitting or a breakdown that's happened, the first option should never be the BC themselves hopping in the truck and running that route, right? Like that should always be the last 
solution because your VC is going to be managing so many other facets of the business and running a route is going to take them away from that focus. Um, so that's kind of number one, I'd say is try really hard to keep your VC off of a route and try to help them kind of wrap their mind around themselves as the last solution to that hamster wheel solution. Um, the other things that I think they need to really be mindful of are, um, first, driver communication. So your drivers are going to be worked harder during peak season than they are any other time of the year. They are going to be tired. Their bodies are going to hurt. I've run routes during peak. And I tell you at the end of the day, like when I say you're sore, you're really, really sore. It's like you've worked out for seven days straight without taking a break. Right. Um, so they're going to be a little bit more on edge and they're going to need a little bit more time and attention and they're need, they're going to need to be heard if they have concerns. So your BC is going to be in an environment where things are moving really quickly. They're being pulled in a lot of different directions. And so reminding them that they still need to hear their driver's concerns and make time for their drivers is really important because it's, it's makes no sense to lose a, a frustrated driver um, that you really need during peak season just because they don't feel heard or like someone's communicating with them, um, especially newbie drivers to like over communicate with the new drivers to make sure that you retain them. Yeah, that's a super important part too. And then, you know, as you're, um, and I'm, I'm curious how much of your BCs are involved in this process, Grace, versus, um, you know, what, what you're doing even at a higher level than that. But um, as you guys are trying to control costs, right, you know, that's such a big part of the conversation in that ramp up for peak season. You know, are there any strategies or goals that you set out for your BCs, you know, to try to control costs? Or are there other tips and tricks on kind of, you know, cost management that you go through in that process? Yeah, I try to remind RBCs that we don't have to use every single driver we recruit every single day, right? Your seasonal hires are coming on board for um, a seasonal position that is not full-time. It's not a guaranteed 40 hours a week. And so I, I really try to help them wrap their mind around, like, it's okay to cut routes because I think there's this fear during peak season that can happen sometimes where they think that all of this volume is just gonna magically fall from the sky and we're gonna be responsible for running it. We've got trends and we've got data, we know what to plan for. And if for some reason the volume doesn't come that we're expecting, we've got to be really quick to adjust. I think that's somewhere, or I think that's an area where people um, kind of got hurt last peak financially is the, they kept thinking the volume's coming, the volume's coming and they kept the trucks and they kept the people and they kept running them. And, you know, it just wasn't efficient. And so people bled on their payroll and on their truck cost. And if I see that the volume isn't coming, I return vehicles, I cut drivers, you know, it's, it's a seasonal position. So it's a little bit easier to do that than, you know, cutting full-time employees. Yeah. And I, I guilty as charged, right? Last week was the <laughs> peak season and I've heard you say that and it's like still so tempting and so hard to want to do that, but it's yeah. so important. And, um, so yes, uh, paid that price for sure. <laughs> um, so definitely listen to grace. She's always right. <laughs> David, that has proved me well at this point in my life. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, I think kind of another big piece of this grace, just, you know, you started to talk about this last peak season. Let's talk about what, what are you expecting this peak season? Anything that's different, you know, what are some of the things that are on your mind? And again, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but, uh, as you're trying to get your teams ready, you know, what are, what are you thinking could be different about this peak season or, or that might not look like past peak seasons? Yeah. I don't think it's going to be a big peak. I really don't. Um, I think it's going to be somewhat flat. And so we are really planning with that in our mindset to say, all right, how can we scale up just enough to be on the line to handle the volume, but not anything above and beyond. And I really don't think we're going to see a huge surge this peak. Um, so we're trying to be as minimalistic as we can be. Um, so that's kind of first part to that. And in terms of things being different, I would say uh, for the majority of contractors, who are um, using the qual cert program now, it's gonna be a really different experience bringing in seasonal hires and having to put them through that safety training. Um, so I actually have, um, I've heard through the grapevine that Bright Flag Recruiting is going to make a really exciting announcement um, at the expo that will help. Expo, there's so much happening at expo this year. <laughs> yes. yes. 
and um, and hopefully co cut your costs with that for your your new hires coming on. But um, definitely need to strategize about how we get these people through qual cert and you know how we make it as um, inexpensive as possible because it can be really expensive to rent a space and to pay your VC to train these people and um, it's going to be a different hiring experience this year. Yeah, I totally uh, been curious kind of about that that same thing on just rolling out that in, at this time frame. Uh, what about also, you know, with Schedule L coming down the pipe, Grace, and the importance of safety? Are you guys doing anything special or different or extra, um, you know, just trying to plan for that? Because we know it's always that much harder with seasonal drivers to to preach safety and encourage safety, um, despite, you know, the fact that they're, they're, you know, not on payroll as long or as experienced. So uh, any things that you guys are doing for that? I think that we are really trying to reduce the amount of, um, vans that we put on the road, like rental vans. So whether you use sprinters or, you know, transits or whatever you use, we've seen in the data that the majority of accidents for new drivers happen in transits and sprinters rather than set vans. Um, so you know, do you think like they're more careful because they know they're in like a big vehicle or that's super interesting? Yeah, I mean, I think there could be an argument to say maybe there is just an overwhelming amount of newer drivers in that size vehicle so it could skew the data. But I also do believe wholeheartedly that step vans are the safest delivery vehicle to operate. Um, so I am trying to create solutions in our fleet to utilize more step bands rather than renting transits or sprinters. Um, and then also, if you do that, you're, you're uh, more easily able to implement the safety technology in those vehicles. Um, you're more likely to be able to rent one that has 360 cameras and sonar and vetter and all of those things. And when you rent just like a transit or a sprinter, it might not have any of that safety technology in it. So equipping the drivers with the safety tech and being in the safer vehicle will result in fewer accidents. Yeah, that's one, you know, I get this question a lot from consulting clients. And so I'd love if you could take just a minute and elaborate a little bit on that, Grace, with when you're using a rental or a temporary vehicle, like what, what is that process? Kind of what are the considerations safety technology compliance wise that, you know, you, what hoops do you have to jump through? Because I, I get this question all the time yeah. uh, from clients that are trying to get ramped up. Yeah. So one thing that you absolutely have to have, FedEx won't uh, allow for any of the indemnification or anything if you're in a rental without a, a vetter. You have to have that in rentals now. Um, and so there is a really great like plug and play solution. I know through Ground Cloud, um, I'm sure some others have it as well, where you can just plug it into the cigarette dash. There's an adapter so you can have vetter in those rentals. And that's like the most important thing for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, uh, it's super helpful just to kind of hear hear your take on that, Grace, and, and the things that uh, you're doing to get ramped up for peak season. Again, we, we started this conversation early because, uh, you know, every year there's just a lot of decision making and, and planning that has to happen to be prepared. Again, this peak season could be unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, there's so many big conversations happening uh, in this space right now. And so um, I definitely heard the common theme of we really hope to see you guys at the expo because there's so much exciting stuff uh, that's going to be rolling out at the expo that uh, hopefully is there to be, you know, major cost saving uh, and kind of strategy opportunities for contractors to try to make those good decisions uh, so that we can make this a, a fruitful and productive peak season for sure. So any final thoughts, anything we didn't cover, Grace, that you feel like is a peak season must uh, or, or go to tips, tricks uh, that we didn't hit on for peak season? I will say um, one thing I would encourage everybody to do is to look at your work area planner and look at the optimization to see how optimized are you right now, and then also run a historical analysis with peak planning to see you know, where the FedEx is projecting you to be. I think knowing those two data points is really, really important as you plan for adding resources, because if you've got some efficiency to gain where you are right now, maybe you don't make as many hires. Um, and so we are, Jesse, our director of operations and I are doing um, a session at the expo on both Saturday and Sunday. We're going to run it twice on um, DRO, work area optimization, work area planner, and resource management and payroll management so that we can help you guys really dig into how, how to understand um, how to be as efficient as possible, but also manage your payroll in a time when we're all trying to manage expenses. Uh, so definitely come by that and we would love to help you. 
Yeah, that's amazing. And, and while you're, while you're talking on that one, Grace, it just got me thinking. So with drivers, you know, I think one of the challenges, you know, when you're coming into the space, trying to figure out how many people to hire is, is figuring out what do we need over and above what we have is, is the normal expectation that your drivers, that your kind of core team, are they doing more volume than normal during peak season? How do you set that expectation? How do you manage that mindset? You know, I know my drivers would tell me they're already doing everything they could possibly do in a day every day. Right. So um, how do you think about that when you're planning? Yeah. So um, the first element is mindset and getting their mindset to a place where they a believe they can take more and then b want to take more. And that's where threshold bonuses really come in handy. So if you're not using threshold bonuses now in your operation, you might want to utilize them just for peak to say, all right, these routes or this route, if you break it up, however you want to do it, can do in a normal day, X amount of stops. And then once the driver hits that number of stops, any stop that they do over and above that would equal an extra dollar bonus. That's how we run ours. So if it's a route with a stop threshold of hundred stops, once they do 101, each additional stop is an extra dollar. Um, so that's a super easy way for them to see in a concrete way every day what they're what additional they're making. Um, but also I have a conversation with the drivers to say it is going to be easier to deliver 130 stops during peak, maybe than it even is to deliver 110 non-peak time because your density is increased. And so you're you're doing more stops in the area. It's gonna, it's not just like adding an additional. X amount of stops in normal times of the year. That density is really increasing. So what they're associating with the difficulty of adding that work is, is not accurate. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, it's so funny. I'm like, I guess I don't normally get as much time to pick your brain as I want. So I'm making the most of this webinar, but <laughs> I'm like, now I'm curious about this too, Grace. But in thinking about the drivers too, when you're hiring for your peak season staff, are you hiring like five day a week drivers primarily like when let's talk scheduling for just a second because that's a big deal like are you hiring you know five day a week staff are you hiring part-time staff what kind of expectations do you set when you're staffing up everything I hire I hire people to be five day solutions six day two day one day I really try to piecemeal a lot of different schedules because that gives me more irons in the fire that I can potentially use as contingency planning resources yeah. um, typically though I would say five days is, is the core, but I will hire just about any schedule and work it in. <laughs> okay. I thought you might say that, but I wanted to make sure. So awesome. All right, you guys, well, uh, we've had grace, uh, to tell us a little bit about peak season. Uh, we're going to now move over to open Q and a, before we do that, I'll give you a quick snapshot of what's gone live in the uh, new listing inventory this week. Uh, for those of you that are uh, monitoring that, um, and then we'll jump into live Q&A. We've already got some questions. Grace and I will stay here and we'll go uh, as long as it takes to, to get through questions. So feel free to load those in now. If you missed the very beginning and you wanted to know what the question of the day was, it's what animated character, if you could choose any, uh, whether it's you know a Disney princess or uh, Pixar or any animated character, kind of what's that one that you would totally uh, go to uh, and do uh, if you had the choice. So. Uh, who would you be? All right. So real quick, uh, this past week in new inventory in Las Vegas, Nevada, we had nine PND routes go live at 795. Uh, that listing has, you know, multiple managers, lead drivers in place, spare trucks, assumable truck debt. It's uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. You could come check it out and do your due diligence while you're at the expo <laughs> uh, in a couple of weeks on that one priced at 65% of revenue comes with the scanners, a great close, low daily miles proximity to the terminal on that one. In Richmond, Virginia, we've got a two-part car of seven routes and eight routes uh, listed at 530 and 715 respectively. Um, both have management in place, solid operating margins, spare vehicles, low daily miles territories as well in the Richmond area. In Charleston, South Carolina, I've also got a two-part car of its 10 and nine routes listed uh, both at 799. Uh, management in place for those spare vehicles. Again, low daily miles with fuel prices where we've seen fuel prices. Uh, Grace could certainly attest to the importance of uh, that, especially just right now and, and how much value that that does add. Uh, in Pensacola, Florida, we've got 15 PD routes listed at 1.1 million, uh, assumable truck debt uh, on that one as well. Two managers, spare trucks, high growth, 
beachside territory, not the worst in terms of getting people to <laughs> come to work or having to go check out uh, your operation on that piece. Uh, again, spare drivers, um, great, you know, solid fleet on that one makes up most of the value of the purchase price there. And uh, last one this week is in Durham, North Carolina. We've got seven P&D routes listed at 150. Uh, that is an opportunity that uh, it does not come with trucks. So also might be a great candidate for Hello Truck Lease if you're looking to do something creative on that one. Um, and, but it's a, a good, a good, a good dense delivery area. Uh, on that one as well, and does come with a manager uh, for that Durham. So great entry price, great candidate for Hello Truck, uh, Hello Truck lease, and also uh, comes with management on that one. So that's what I have for you guys this week. So uh, we will launch into Q and A. But first, Grace, if you could be any animated character, <laughs> uh, who would you be and why? Okay, um, I don't remember her name, but I think I would be that girl from Brave. First oh. Of all, yeah. Okay, first of all, already like, already just the red hair thing, like that works. So I think it could happen. But also, she like, Merida, I had to look Mer it up. Merida. Merida. Yes, yes. She is just a boss. I love her. <laughs> that's so, that's so cute. <laughs> Merida for Brave. Yeah, I was like, you really leaned in. I was like, if you were going to say Ariel, I was going to give you a hard time and be like, I'm sure we like Not did bad. that when we were kids, but I'm like, you got to pick something different. But okay, I'll take Brave. She was pretty cool. That was yeah. a good movie. Um, honestly, I don't, I don't know, but this is just my, my feeling today. So I'm going to go with this, but I was a huge fan of the, like, I guess she was the princess soon to be queen aunt from a bug's life. She was just so like, she was, really, I know who you're talking yeah, about. She was so inspiring. And she was like really embracing of, um, I can't remember now I'm blanking on the name of the main character guy, but she was super supportive. She was just such a great like community builder. And I feel like also I loved A Bug's Life because that whole concept of that giant world where they were so tiny was just really mm -hmm. fascinating. So I'm going to go with uh, the princess from A Bug's Life is how I'm feeling. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So we'll dive in. We've got some great ones already and great questions coming in. So uh, first one's going to be from Mike Carter, who said uh, he would be uh, Sully from Monsters, Inc. Great oh, choice. Yeah. Uh, Spencer's youngest child goes by Sully, so he would totally get on board with that one. Uh, we always have a Sully running around here too, so that's great. Um, and the question is, uh, what are the limitations from FedEx on how often you can purchase another contract if you're looking to grow larger? Uh, I guess it's a two-part question, so let's start there. Uh, Grace, you know, you've been alongside that journey, so you want to talk to that one? Yeah, there's no like hard and fast rule. Really, the rule is just around scale. So, you know, you can't go above a scale in a certain building, but um, there's no hard and fast rule for timeline. It's more so what is the local FedEx management's comfortability with you taking on another operation? So do you have good service? Do you have good safety? If yes, then they're probably going to be more willing to approve another deal quicker. That's right. Yeah. So no real policy. I would tell you, I, I think like 90 days is a really good kind of bare minimum timeline that I've seen. Now, have I seen a few contractors do it faster? Yes, but like a good solid 90 day window before you're trying to do that next uh, closing is typically somewhat normal industry standard, but again, there's not a rule. So, um, and then the second part of that is Mike's asking, is it better to look at smaller routes, um, like sub a million dollars or less, or to, to look at operations in that one and a half to $2 million range you know, assuming the purchase price isn't what you're worried about on that, like, does it, does it, is there a better strategic place to start out? Grace, do you have thoughts on that? You've acquired every size operation ever and come yeah. every yes. year. Yes, I have. Um, you know, I think for your first one, starting a little bit smaller is probably the way to go. Um, if it is, uh, I, I don't see a concern really either way. I think it's just how willing are you, are you to be directly involved? And the larger the operation is, the more involvement you'll probably need at the beginning. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah on that one. Okay. Um, and actually you touched on this in the first answer, Grace, but let's elaborate on this. So Chad McCurdy is asking, which for the record, he would do Roadrunner because he said he never gets the bad end of the deal, which that is an excellent play. You're right. <laughs> It's also, I think you could say the same thing about Jerry. Like, I'm like all into the little tiny creatures. I'm realizing as I'm You're talking into the, about yeah. mice and ants. Like, I don't know where this is coming from, but yeah, they like always come out on top. So I appreciate that, that rationale, Chad. That's a good, it's like a lucky strategy there. 
Um, uh, but his question, Grace, is I've heard FedEx has limits on how much of a single terminal you can contract as a single business. Is that a way for FedEx to manage risk? And is there a, a set official percentage limit per terminal or how is that determined? Uh, and you talked about it, but would you mind elaborating? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, there's not a specific number set just across the network to say you can only be x percent of any building in the fedex network but typically it's around 10 percent is what we see that fedex doesn't want any one contractor to be larger than 10 percent of the total volume of the building um, and it is a, a risk mitigation um, strategy where you know if one contractor failed or decided not to provide service um, the whole terminal wouldn't go down in blazing flames yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it varies so much. And, you know, one of the things is you guys are looking at different businesses, if you're on that kind of acquiring side, uh, generally, we're going to be able to make that available to you in terms of like what the scale limitation in that building is, because as Grace said, it's so different in, in, in every building, because you have to think about, you know, if, if you're operating out of Rialto, California, you know, 2% of the terminal volume in Rialto might be 20 routes, whereas if you were 2% of the terminal volume in Paducah, Kentucky, that might be one route, you know, so uh, that's why we we see such variation, you know, on what that scale percentage looks like, but um, that's right on. So uh, next question comes from Jay Mays. Hey, Jay. And Jay um, said he would be Huckleberry Hound. Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. Um, and uh, he just wanted you to clarify, Grace, when you were kind of talking about what you are estimating for peak season this year, and you said you're kind of anticipating like some flat volume levels, are you meaning flat relative to last peak season or flat relative to like a current delivery day and that you're not expecting a ramp? Um, the first, so just flat related to uh, last year. Yeah. And what would you say, Grace, just kind of thinking back, what's what's a reasonable and I guess I know it depends market to market. But if I made you get in a box and pick a number, mm -hmm. um, like what percentage of additional volume would you say is kind of that that maybe if we saw something like last year, normal peak season increase? I would say probably 20 percent. OK, perfect. Um, all right. So next question uh, comes from. Uh, oh, I'll uh, grab this one, but Jason Witt, oh, he would be Thor. <laughs> so, okay, super powerful. Um, but he was asking if they can watch the expo uh, on a webinar and uh, no, we do not have the expo like live cast. Um, you know, this is something, this is our big celebration every year, uh, you know, getting everybody there um, together, the, the kind of power of, of what that's going to be with all the contractors on site is, you know, really what we're targeting. Um, some of the content will be available uh, after the expo, but this is definitely designed to be an all hands on deck uh, in person experience. Um, to, to really get the full power of what the expo is. It's absolutely my favorite weekend of the year. Um, and, and there's just really nothing like the energy of bringing that many entrepreneurs and small business owners, the literal backbone of, you know, our economy, uh, that, you know, those that are literally providing all these jobs across the country, providing all of the infrastructure that, that gets consumer goods to them. Uh, there's just so much power in, in the room and in the space. And so we definitely try to make that a, a big celebration. So you just got to be there. So hopefully um, we will uh, see you there for that. Uh, next question comes from Andy Rod, uh, who said uh, he would be a racer X from Speed Racer. Do you know that one, Grace? Uh -huh. Oh, I don't know that one. Speed Racer. What's Speed Racer? You'll know it when you see it. Okay, I'll have to look that one up. So Racer X is who Andy would be. Uh, for the record, he said terrific information as always, Grace. We know that. Um, and wants to know, uh, Grace, we were literally just talking about this. Um, are you uh, are you guys considering or thinking anything about AVP for peak season this year? Seems really interesting, um, specifically for the ends of like maybe rural routes. But what are you thinking on that, Grace? Yeah, um, so there was an interesting... Um, some interesting information that's recently come out about AVP related to Schedule L. Um, so I I haven't 100% confirmed if uh, if AVP incidents will be included in Schedule L or not, but there is talk of and thoughts of it not being included, which would definitely encourage all of us to look more closely at AVP. Um, AVP is a really, really great solution for um, rural areas for sure if you want to cut out some of those stem miles and just have um have someone with their honda civic come in and deliver those packages out in the more rural areas 
One thing that you can do too is you can shuttle packages on like a straight truck out to a certain like outpost, like a Walmart or something in that delivery territory if you have a bunch of stem miles and then have your AVP drivers actually meet you at that outpost and pull packages off from there. Um, so that's one way to kind of use it creatively, tons of ways to use it creatively, but, um, but it's becoming a more interesting solution in the network, um, especially if you're having trouble finding drivers. Like if you're in an area where, um, for instance, I've, I've been involved with operations that are located in um, vacation towns, right? Where they're super popular in the summer, lots of tourism, not a lot of people live there in the winter, right? And so hiring for peak season is really tough because the population is small. It's usually an older population. That might be a scenario if you're in an area like that, where you can recruit AVP drivers to help supplement your candidate pool. That's right. Um, okay, next question, uh, Grace, comes from uh, Ryan Valerio, who said the character he would choose to be would be Danny Phantom, who wouldn't want to be a ghost, LOL. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a blast from the past. Yeah, who wouldn't want to be a ghost? Um, Ryan's uh, question, uh, Grace, is how does someone solve code 16 on packages that are not declared inside the truck, but are somewhere in the manifest terminal? How would a contractor solve this when they can't find the package? Okay, um, let me make sure I'm understanding this. So we might, we might need to take this one yeah. offline because there's some follow-up on that, some questions I have on that because <laughs> if you have it if, if something is a code 16 then it it's not that it doesn't exist or that you like there is a code that's applied to the box so maybe code 85 is what we're trying to solve for which is like missing package where there has been a scan onto the van but there is no scan by the driver for two three four days um so that would be something that is a code 85 so maybe we'll take that one offline and do some follow-up so I can ask some questions to better help problem solve. Yes, that's right. So just, and and two, if you have follow-up questions like this, and there's no way we'll ever get to all of the questions on the open Q&A, you guys. So if we don't answer something or if it needs some clarification like that, um, you can always just go to info at routeconsultant.com and shoot us an email. Uh, and we will make sure that it gets uh, to Grace to get the right answer for you or uh, someone on the team will make sure that you guys get your, your questions answered. Mm -hmm. um, next question. It's a great one uh, from uh, Jose Baranger, who said uh, beep beep roadrunner as well. <laughs> Um, and uh, so he said he's you know been in the process of considering purchasing a route, but obviously with everything happening in the FedEx space right now, there's been a ton of you know press and media. Obviously, we're releasing you know a lot of statements uh, on just the condition of operators right now. And so he said, kind of as as CEOs in the space, Grace, you know, definitely very much living the realities of these businesses every day. Um, what what are our views on the ongoing situation and downturn for current contractors, and then you know recommendations for prospective investors? I'm happy to speak to that too, but you want to take a take a first shot at that, Grace? Yeah, you know, I I would say from an operator's perspective, this is a time where we really have to cut the fat in our operations, and you know we are um, we're running skeleton crews. We are uh, making sure that we are not having any extra bit of fat in the budget. Um, and that makes us more efficient. It makes our operation better at the end of the day. Um, and so, you know, when things restore in the, in the network, um, and when the pendulum swings back to where we need it to be from a, uh, contract and comp perspective, we're going to be positioned to make the most of that. And we're going to have super efficient businesses. So I'm really focused on that. Um, and then Annalie, you want to talk about the investment piece of it? Yeah, and it's it's so great. I was just trying to look up. There's this great quote um, that I always talk about. That's like you know, hard times breed. Um, I want to find that quote, but there it is. Hold on. Uh, hard times create strong people. Strong people create good times. Good times create weak people, and weak people create hard times. You know, there's this amazing cycle um, that that we see. And and Grace is talking about this pendulum swing. It's a pendulum we've watched swing. You know, since we've been in this space that. Um, you know, we go back and forth in seasons as as operators where, you know, profitability moves in different directions uh, as that swings. And as Grace is saying, you know, we're in that tougher season right now, but where it's really breeding really strong teams, 
really great leaders, great drivers, you know, and, and we're creating that. And then as that pendulum continues to swing, you know, we really are going to reap the benefits of it. And so uh, I think everything she said there is totally right. And, and the thing that I, you know, we're talking about with a lot of the prospective investors that are looking at this space is, you know, when, when we were looking at business valuations this time last year, you know, you were paying a serious premium because these contracts were seeing all of this uh, rise and lift from, you know, COVID. We were seeing just these fat, juicy margins, uh, these businesses that literally doubled in size and valuation, uh, sometimes even more so um, over a 12 month period. And so, you know, we're kind of now on the pivot of that. And so as an investor, if you're going in with the right strategy, ultimately the long game of e-commerce, like the the, re, the the thought and the the consideration that two years from now, people are going to be ordering anything less online than what they're doing right now is absurd. You know, like I finally just bought the bullet and now I order my shoes online. I, I said for years, the only thing I won't order is shoes because, you know, I just have to try them on and make sure they feel right. And I finally just ordered sneakers for the expo <laughs> literally online this week and they fit and it was great. And I didn't return them and it was awesome. Um, so, you know, people are not moving in the direction of less online shipping. So the long game of this industry is still extremely promising, but in a lot of ways, you know, I, I look at it like a traditional investment cycle and saying right now is when you want to buy because, you know, contractors that didn't sell, you know, when things were really high and elevated, if they're seeing those contractions and margins, you know, there's, there's distress in the space right now. And so some of them are just like we see it in any type of recession or, you know, downturn in any economic market, uh, or asset class, you see people that reach a point where they need to sell and, you know, you get a, you can get a good deal in those moments. So it's, um, it's just, it's, it's just like any other investment or asset class. And so that's really kind of how I'm looking at it and saying, I'm still super optimistic about the long-term of the space. And so right now might be the time to buy, but you do need to be strategic and intentional about it and saying, Hey, if, if I need to go in and make sure we've got good capital reserves and that we're, you know, truly looking at it the right way and, and maybe not necessarily anticipating it in the short term to be that, you know, get rich quick scheme, right? Which anybody that ever thought it was going to be that <laughs> was probably misinformed. Um, but it's important to go into it with that right mindset. Uh, and then and then if that's the case, I'm still super bearish on space. So a uh, bullish on space, sorry. <laughs> um, so anyways, that's what I would say there, uh, Jose. Uh, next question comes from, let's see, um, Logan. Oh, Logan Panasco, who said uh, he'd be Doug the dog from Up. That's so cute. <laughs> um, and Logan's question, Grace, is um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, a line haul specific for peak season? Uh, we, we touch on this sometimes, but can you just give us a quick update of some of the things we talked about at the beginning? What's different when it's line haul? Yeah, line haul really doesn't have the seasonality that P&D does. So you might have opportunities to pick up extra work. Um, and I would certainly position yourself for that if you've got the resources to do it. Um, but you aren't going to need to staff up to meet more demands for the runs that you're contractually holding. Yeah, it's definitely definitely a different animal uh, on the line haul side, um, but you know, lots of potential, you know, that you'll make, I think, for being able to run wild and having those resources for sure during peak season, uh, but definitely not in the same demands. Um, uh, John Webb's question, Grace, uh, who said, <laughs> this is so good, he would be foghorn leghorn, so you'd always be the one giving the advice regardless of how wrong it may be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, John's question is, uh, does using a part-time mechanic slash driver on staff require any special approvals from FedEx? Do you have to make any changes to your work comp policy? I know we're big advocates for kind of having this multifaceted individual grace. Any changes that makes for you? No, really. Um, the only time that you have to get approval for a vendor to come onto the yard is if they're a vendor, right? And so if it's just a driver or someone in your space, or in your operation, um, you don't need an extra approval from FedEx. Um, you know, from a work comp standpoint, I think that it's it's kind of up to you on what how you want to classify them, like what class code you want to use for that employee. Um, if there is if they're trying to do like an engine swap and uh, an engine falls on their face, which literally happened to one of my mechanics, 
Uh, I was really glad that we had the right class code on that person, but you know, I, I think you could pretty easily keep them as a driver and you will be just fine. Um, and plus you can't do major engine swaps at the terminal. So if they're just doing light maintenance at the terminal and stuff like that, um, totally, totally fine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Grace, we've been going for 50 minutes. So I'm gonna hit you with two to three more questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up for today. Um, so let's see, the next question comes from, um, it's funny, uh, Martin Cazares, who said uh, he'd be Bugs Bunny. He seems to always be lucky and get away with everything. I love it. <laughs> strategy. All these guys are like just choosing the lucky character. I know. I was like, there's a lot of strategy in here. It's like we got a, a you know, room full of entrepreneurs, savvy little scrappy entrepreneurs. Good. Everybody is so scrappy. I'm over here like, I want to be the ant princess, but <laughs> they're like being so strategic. Um, Martin's question, Grace, is uh, what, what is, you know, allowed here in terms of can FedEx come in and request any changes be made to fleet or personnel from one day to the other? I love this example. He said, like, example, can we request, can they request that our trucks all be painted pink for the month of October? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. So FedEx uses the schedules in your contract to make changes to any sort of contractual requ requirements. Um, or standards. So, um, you know, the, the example that my mind goes to is the decals that are on the truck. So FedEx used to have different colored decals for each division of FedEx. So there was one that was, um, you know, orange and purple for ground. And then there was green and purple for FedEx ground. And there's express and custom critical. They all have their own like color combo. And so um, there was an initiative a few years ago to standardize that and to all move to one color of decals and logos. And so they did require all the contractors to de-logo their trucks and replace them with the right color. Um, sometimes you see some legacy trucks running around with the old colors, but uh, for the most part now the network has switched over. So that was something that was required. Yeah. Um, Grace, next question comes from Jeremy Finnerty, who said he would be Scrooge McDuck with no explanation. So I got to read on you, Jeremy. I'm watching you. <laughs> um, and then uh, this is a good, we didn't define this earlier, Grace. What is AVP? Can you go ahead and tell oh, us about yes. what that program is? So AVP stands for Alternative Vehicle Program, and it is just a way for you to utilize um, trucks and drivers that aren't necessarily typical FedEx trucks or FedEx drivers um, to deliver packages. So when you use the AVP program, um, any, any personal vehicle that is, I believe, 15 years old or newer that meets, you know, some basic safety things like think of, you know, an, a car that could be used for Uber, right? Like they have some requirements that vehicles are a certain age or um, have some certain safety features like seat belts or for, you know, the FedEx space, um, vehicles have or packages have to be able to be locked inside a vehicle. So the car must lock or if you're using a truck, it has to have a bed that locks. So there are some requirements, but most personal vehicles will work for the AVP program. Um, and those vehicles will show up to the terminal and they'll take small packages and go out and run, uh, run that route rather than those packages being on a typical step van. Yes. Um, okay, and then also um, one important question here. Uh, uh, Shay Lee said uh, also, he said he'd be Racer X. Oh, he said Racer X rocks, but since Andy took that one, he'll choose Speed Racer. So you guys can be brothers. <laughs> um, and uh, Shay, Shay was asking, uh, if they're wanting to book rooms and Danielle, you may have to clarify this one for us, but if they're wanting to book rooms at Harrah's, is there the, a best path for them to do that since Paris is sold out? Um, or how do they, how do they go about doing that? Do you just call Harrah's direct, uh, or you can drop a link if there's a, a website they're supposed to visit. I just want to make sure I don't tell them wrong. Yeah. I'll put the link again from, um, our website and I, I believe Bally's has really good rates too. If they just want to source that online, like TripAdvisor, um, but yeah, I'll drop a link in there in the chat, everybody. All right. 
Um, so uh, as always, we're not going to get to all of these questions, um, but I really appreciate all of you guys being here and tuning in this week. Uh, Grace, so always appreciate you joining us and the wealth of knowledge that you bring um, and so excited to hopefully see a lot of you in person here in just a couple weeks uh, in Vegas at the Expo. Uh, our team is working full tilt, full cylinder uh, to get ready. We're so excited. This is literally going to be the best and definitely the biggest Expo yet. So uh, we will hopefully see you guys in a couple weeks in Vegas and uh, otherwise next week we will see you same time, same place. So bye everybody. Bye.